All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Aiden Crenshaw. Sorry for getting started a little late. Just had to get all the camera stuff set up. Uh, our talk today is going to be on the game we'll be playing here a little bit later on. It's called Netcoff, short for Network King of the Hill. Essentially, it's a CTF for lazy bastards. <laughs> all right. A little bit about me. I'm on the website irongeek.com. We have mostly information security related videos, some articles and whatnot, a few tools I've written that occasionally get flagged as malware. I have an interest in infosec education. I like teaching people things. Um, so that's one of the reasons I go out to all these conferences and give talks and also record over people's videos and place them up online. I don't know if I'm just a geek with time on our hands. It's possible I'll get some things wrong. Since this is about a game I created, more than likely I'm right and you're wrong. But a lot of my talks, I'd always like to put this in there because occasionally I will spout BS. Uh, Bruce Potter uh, likes to say, uh, you know, don't trust anybody, even him. Check the facts out for yourself. And I'm also in a regular on the ISD podcast. That's in there because this is a template from way back when, this first slide. And unfortunately, we are now defunct. But if you want to listen to like how many episodes did we finally end up with, Bill? Four, five hundred? Hundred. It was probably. It was a three, lot. Yeah, it was four or five hundred. So if you want a history of infosec from sort of 2009 to 2013, early. Yeah, February 2013 was the last show. I'm also an information security engineer at a Fortune 1000 company and a co-founder of DerbyCon. All right, here's a little bit about running a CTF. CTF is a capture the flag event. You have, and the idea is that you have a series of flags, you try to semi-simulate a real world uh, hacking attempt where someone says, all right, we've got these boxes out there to get this PI, this personal identifier information out there that you've got to get a hold of or some other criteria. So you've got to break into this machine, get into this machine, get into this machine, and do these sets of things to get points and win the game. It's a pain though, because you have to get all the gear to the con. So it's a bunch of like laptops and machines you have to get there, depending on what you want people to hack. Uh, drag all that out to the con, especially if you have to fly someplace, is uh, difficult. Uh, you have to come up with different scenarios each year, because if you run the exact same scenario every single year, people know exactly how it's done. It's not going to be a very interesting game. And so you have to get creative every year. And once I said, this is a lazy, you know, way of being a lazy bastard. And finally, Dave Kennedy comes to your game and pops your box. Uh, this is what happened a few years back. I ran my first CTF, and Dave Kennedy was one of the people who uh, was on one of the teams. And he didn't come get scope first. So he's like, running around, popping boxes, like, oh, crap, ooh, this box I got into. Okay, videos of how to win the CTF or something. Huh, I think I may have popped the wrong box. It ends up I had an SMB2 unpatched vulnerability. The patch hadn't released yet. If I had my firewall up, it wouldn't have got to me. But he came up and <laughs> apologized, and that's how I met uh, Dave Kennedy there. All right. Oh, the other people on his team was like, uh, oh, great, uh, Martin Boss uh, and uh, Archangel. And yeah, it was a pretty um, hardcore team, and they were the ones that won the game. Funny thing is, they would have won earlier, and I'll tell you why in a bit. But here's how my first CTF went, just to share the pain of how I set it up and why the Netcoff system makes things a lot simpler if you just want to run a game and have some fun. Uh, I, one of the goals of how I designed the game was so I could demo attack techniques to observers so people would be going by our tables and going, oh, what are these people doing here? Oh, they're doing real live hacker exercises. That's neat. So we want to show people what exactly we were doing. Uh, also, I wanted everyone to be able to achieve something. I didn't want people to come to the game and go, uh, well, I just totally got pwned. I didn't get any points. This is sad, this is not fun at all. So you want people to feel like they're actually participating. So I tried to make most of the goals achievable and have a set number of points so it wasn't all or nothing. It wasn't like you get to the final box and crack it or you don't. So at least people felt that they accomplished something. Now that being said, I kind of screwed up there and there were a few people that didn't even get past the first goal because my, um, my first challenge was find the wireless SID. I turned, off, uh, I turned on SID cloaking. I didn't have SIDs broadcasting. So people couldn't find the wireless network unless they knew to use something like Kismet and get it out of the air whenever someone associated. By the way, you see this advice from time to time about turning off SID broadcasting? Please don't do that shit. First of all, if someone has any kind of passive monitoring going on and someone associates, they're going to see the SID because of how the protocol works. They're going to find the wireless network name anyway unless there's no traffic. If there's no traffic, you probably only need to keep it that secure. It's probably not that important if you're not actually using it. But they're going to be able to find that regardless. And also, on some older systems at least, I think it's gotten better. But in some older systems, if you turn off SID broadcasting, it causes all sorts of connect connectivity issues. At least it seemed to. But that's a bit of a diversion. All right. This is also uh, why I did the point base. People would have some feeling that they were accomplishing something in the game. 
and I had to put all this together from scratch. And I actually got the old Pentium M out of my car that I'm going to try to get rid of this weekend that I actually ran the game of from. Because back then I was still working at university, wasn't making much money, so I put together everything I could out of a garbage can. Now that I'm still making more money now, that I still find myself pulling stuff out of hazmat piles and garbage cans because I love old equipment and making it, wow, this is getting thrown out. I can use this for something, which is why my house looks like crap right now. Um, actually, I've started a website. If you buy, this is, again, another off-topic subject, but I started a website called hackerswapmeet.org where people can meet up at different cons and say, hey, I'm going to bring this old Cisco gear, this old laptops I have no use for. Who wants to trade? But I said, fair, I'll poke that out. Because I'm a digital pack rat, and so I had a lot of stuff laying around. But it was kind of crappy and not exactly as fast as I needed it to be. You also have to haul all this stuff to the conference, which for me, my first CTF was in Louisville, so that wasn't a big issue. But if I had to haul all that on a plane, that'd be bad. The way the first uh, CTF was set up, I essentially just had a router and a wireless camera and a couple VMs running on a laptop and uh, another box. So it would attach the Wi-Fi on and off so people could sit, sniff that uh, SID out of the air. See, I, Georgia, I had to drive myself here today because you, you promised me last night that you were going to drive me here in the morning, but no, I had to get here on time myself. Car? What are you talking about? <laughs> but so I had it basically set up like this. And we'll get to why I have the camera there in a little bit. That was part of the challenge. And something I want to add back in the net cost, you know, more diverse weird hardware on the, on the game. So that was where it was set up. I actually have a whole video about how it was set up, up on my website. And here are the basic steps that people intended to figure out and do during the game. First, they had to figure out how to attach the wireless, which meant usually bringing up Kismet. And since they had a machine constantly associating it, they'd be able to pull that SID out of the air. One person wasn't able to do that. But most people at least got that far, and they got so many points for it. They had to find the IP address of a Windows box. The reason I did that was I wanted people to use uh, OS detection and nmap and figure out, okay, which box is the Windows box? Okay, I think I figured it out. And it's owned by this particular person, and I found it, so I got five points. Then I had to find, them, they had to find an x86 Linux box. And I specified x86 because technically that webcam I had up there a second ago is also Linux. And they got so many points for finding that. They had to find two open ports and list them. So these are like little sub flags that they at least get a few points for so they feel like they're cheating something. Once they get in, they had to find that the uh, admins are running their own internet website on it, and they want to find out what server type it is. I did that in there as a flag just so they show them how to do banner grabbing, where they basically, well, there's several ways to do it. The will do it for you automatically, or you can tell it to the port and, you know, type some garbage or, you know, get space slash space HTTP slash 1.1. Do I got that right? No one's correcting me, so I'm assuming I got it close enough. Do a banner grab and it will report back to you who is uh, running the server. And then I want uh, people to find the administrator's password on the Windows box. Well, the way I had people do that was, as I recall, I had a bunch of vulnerabilities in there. I think this one was still uh, vulnerable to the blaster vulnerability. So people would get in with Metasploit, as uh, Georgia demonstrated yesterday, use a interpreter, dump the password hashes, and crack them. Since I still had Landman password hashes on there, that was super easy. Because the way, has anybody heard how Landman hashes work? This is a truly dumbass design. They, um, the essential way it works is they take whatever password you put in, up to 14 characters, as long as 14, it doesn't generate an LM hash. But they take the 14 characters, they split into two seven digit chunks, make it all uppercase, and then they uh, use, a, let me see if I remember that, they use it, to encrypt a magic number, as I recall, and that becomes the password hash. Did I get that right? Yeah. And uh, the magic number is well known, but uh, it's not, it, you can't exactly instantly reverse it, but since it's split into seven character chunks, running through all possible seven character combinations of, let's say, all letters or all letters and numbers, doesn't take too long on a modern machine. And since it's seven and seven, the, um, the mathematics involved with cracking a seven and a seven is much easier than cracking one whole 14. Because once you go through, it basically it's the same as running through all possible combinations of seven characters. And probably you're going to reach it in less time than that. That's the worst case scenario. And once they have that, well, a lot of people use password reuse. So they can use that same password to get into another box. And uh, I can't remember exactly all the scenarios I had them go through, but I think they may use that to get into this box. 
And uh, if they got into that box, I suppose they could grab the shadow file and also crack the passwords there. Um, and finally, they're supposed to find this um, TrueCrypt volume that I had up there that had the personal identifiable information. And that was like the final thing to do. Well, actually, the final thing was to crack that. But to crack that, the password was, I believe, in some web application. They had to do certain types of injection to be able to pull the password out. And uh, they had to use some other information to find the password for the non-x86 box. Oh, wait a sec. Let me remember this right. No, sorry. The password for the webcam was hidden inside of some other web application in someone's um, uh, chat list. And they had to do some injections to be able to become that other user, some kind of like a session hijacking, as I recall. It's been a while since I ran the game. They found the Linux, the password for the Linux box that was non x86, which happened to be that webcam of mine, which was, I think, some ARM or MIPS-based platform. And then there was a password that that webcam would give you. But here's the thing. I think um, oh, Dave's team would have ran, run the game about 45 minutes earlier if they had realized that the webcam could move. What I'd done was I'd put the password on a post-it note on a laptop screen. The idea was that they were going to hack into that webcam, find the password someplace else for the webcam, and then move it and go, oh, someone put the password for the TrueCrypt volume on a post-it note on a screen. But they didn't realize they could turn the camera until 45 minutes in or so. So they could have run a lot earlier. But they turned the camera, they find that password, they could unzip it, and then they could after they, oh, sorry, unzip it. They uh, could unencrypt the TrueCrypt volume. At that point, they could go ahead and get the CSV file where I put the names of a bunch of people I knew from InfoSec and the various um, medical information about them, like, uh, oh, I think I made John Strand be afraid of clowns, whatever that particular phobia is, and this, maybe someone else was like con-related stress. Uh, but various cracks like that. The thing is, I went through all that stuff, and it took me a few minutes to explain it, if I had to come up with that scenario, a new scenario every single year, so it would be the exact same thing, because you don't want the same people from last year showing up for the new con and winning every single year. That gets boring. That's right. a good thing why John's not here. Right. Well, Hackett ran last year, right? Yeah. So I didn't want to come up with a new scenario every year. So what are my other options? Well, that's why I came up with NetCall. Forget scenarios. Essentially, you can almost set up the same thing every single year. It's fun to make it vary, but you don't have to. The game varies itself because as people learn new techniques, it's kind of like chess. As you play it, you learn it, you learn new counters for other people. Uh, I can use the same setup over and over again. Once again, I said this was basically a CTF for lazy bastards. And uh, players can learn from past games and come up with better ways to pwn. Uh, contestants are the ones that make it vary. The admin doesn't have to make it vary. Though if you want to throw in new scenarios, that's nice. So here's the way NetConf is set up, more or less. So that's why I'm doing this all in one machine with a VM and an a software access point at this point. So it's even smaller to carry the conferences. But essentially, you just need to, the way you know King of the Hill is scored is it's King of the Hill. You're supposed to stay on top. So you're supposed to reach out there and own a box and keep it. So once you get in, if you can patch it or keep other people from taking it away from you, you keep getting points. And for every minute that you keep a box, you get extra points. So the idea is to be King of the Hill. Grab a box and hold it. Problem is, and people do different techniques and when they get in. Some people concentrate too much on one box and not the entire network, so they, they end up losing all, not getting as many potential points as they could. Another thing is you have to keep potential services running. I mean, people could take down boxes, but they have to actually keep it up and running for them to be able to get points. If they take down the website on it, no one's getting any points. And this is somewhat similar to a real world attack where you want to get in, but you don't want to be obvious that you've gotten in. Now, if you were doing them to be obvious you got in, you wouldn't be defacing like, the website like we are doing here in a short, short bit. But you want to keep services up and running. You don't want to be obvious about the attack. And I also made some rules where you could attack the network layer because I knew people were going to do that. And I'll explain a little bit more about that in a minute. So here's the way the rules work for the game. First, the teams will be given a range of IPs to attack. Don't attack outside of that. Dave. Uh, and uh, so they'll have like, various vulnerable uh, servers running websites. And uh, with respect to the get in the box, and I was going to vary which ones. W yes? I kind of want to make clear that you'll be using your own wireless I'll be network. using my own wireless network that I'll be you setting up. You'll be using the university's wireless network. Correct. There will be a SID called NetCoff that you'll be joining to play the game. But I set up a range of machines where you can attack. You're not supposed to attack other people's machines that are going to be on the network. 
Uh, teams try to put their own defacements on the website, and they can do whatever they want as far as defacing it, but to get actual score, they have to use a team tag. And whatever's inside that team tag, that's what's going to be put into the scoring engine for saying, let's say, Bill's uh, Brigadoons, I don't know. I think I was uh, Thundercats. Thundercats, okay. Time, yeah. So if Thundercats is in the team tag, that's what's going to end up in the scoreboard as who owns it. And every minute or so, it goes through and checks and says, who owns this site as of right now? And those people get points. And uh, referees will work as a blue team from time to time. Having someone own a box and own a speed to get into it gets kind of boring. So referees will occasionally act as blue team, come in and fix problems or maybe restore an old image to keep things interesting. Or in one case, uh, do some countermeasures to keep people from art poisoning the network. When I originally designed the game, I figured the first thing people would do with art poison the network and not actually own the box. And I'll cover that in here in a second. Some more general rules. Only penetrate the host and don't penetrate the scoring engine because um, my Python code is probably pretty crappy, so it's possible that you might be able to <laughs> screw with that. I've tried to make some countermeasures to keep people from XSSing the score box itself, but uh, who knows. Uh, Dossing the network and, tra and uh, messing with traffic is allowed. Though keep in mind, if you DOS it too bad and you own some boxes, you're not going to get any points because no one, the score engine can't reach out to the box and get the scores. However, if you're the person winning and you're still winning right now, DOSing it might actually be a decent technique because then it won't get other people's scores. So I guess it depends on how far along in the game you are. Uh, you got to stay on the net cough get network while attacking. So make sure that you're on the Netcraft network and not attacking Marshall University, please. I don't think Bill wants angry letters. Or to go to jail. <laughs> or to go to jail. But dude, or to see one else. you're so pretty. Oh. Uh, the ref may change the rules at will because I'm a jerk. I put it in there just in case weird things happen. And uh, you may view the scores at 10.0099, which is where I have it set up. Now the scoring engine is fairly simple. Uh, Essentially, I originally wrote it in Auto at 3, but then I wouldn't be able to do it on anything but Windows of the score box. So I put it to Python instead. And the idea was to make it flexible, simple, fast, and non blocking. And also cross site scripting resistant so people wouldn't be screwing with the score box. Because even if it's against the rules, they're still going to do it. I have a little, oh, by the way, this script is already out there. And when I post this video, I'll probably include a link to it there as well. Uh, essentially, the way people set things up is you set up an you know, INI file where you want to put the output file, how long you want to sleep between score, sleep between score checks, and each one of the websites that you want to check for the basement with the team tag. And uh, that's Sosin's code. Let me see if I can actually find it. Okay, your next question. Yes. I mean, so network layer is in scope, is that correct? Network layer is in scope. Okay. Though once people get really you know frisky with that, I end up changing things up some so that you that won't work for you. Because letting some of this art poison network forever and ever, that gets boring really, really quick. Text Wrangler. Yeah, here's a simple Python code I wrote for it that uh, just imports the URL lib libraries and is set to automatically download the websites every so many. Well, every so many seconds, wherever you have configured in the INI file, grab things and generate a web page for you based on a template. So you can edit the template for different conferences if you want to. But there's not a whole lot of code to it. Python is fairly powerful and simple to, to use. And I already have this out there. I did a version of this talk for um, Freaknik. And you can check out the link if you like there. And whatever hap what happened to my mouse pointer? Oh, there we go. Cool. Demo time. That was what the demo looked like as far as code is concerned. Now, I've ran this a few times by now, and here's some of the scenarios I see happening. And um, kind of, sometimes I'm kind of shocked by the things that people don't do. One of the weird, odd results I had was Windows 98 seemed to be the most secure OS ever. Of the boxes I pop up, and I deliberately made OS 10, oh, sorry, uh, forced to have it. Mental malfunction. I deliberately made Windows 98 vulnerable on this. I mean, I don't know if I have any patches on it or not, but it's an old Windows 98 box. We don't have physical access to it. No metasploit for it. Well, the, 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 not that, but also Windows 98 by in general doesn't have 
as many network accessible anything yeah. as modern Windows does. Uh, so what I did was I opened up the entire C drive to the world as writable, and still no one was hacking it. Except that jerk back there. Yeah, well, you, and you know why no one was hacking it? Because in more modern Windows, which a lot of people are using, and I suppose maybe in some more modern Sambas as well, they were turning off the sending of LM hash. So without doing LM, so, the reason it didn't work at HackerCom 1 was that your hate didn't properly share the drive. Oh, that might be one of the, yeah. yeah. That was one of the reasons that we couldn't hack it. Uh, I should say, yeah, it wasn't using LM authentication, and since the, the new machines weren't sending LM authentication, but Windows 98 at the time would only accept it, no one could connect. At one particular place, the only person who was hacking the 98 box was someone who was using an Android phone, and whatever app they were using just happened to... That was at, uh, wasn't it at, uh, Louisville InfoSec a couple Louisville years ago. Oh, 2011, because that was just before the first DerbyCon. Yeah. So, um, there's actually a little registry tree you can turn back on the uh, use of uh, LM authentication, though you'd want to turn that off as soon as you uh, leave the game. Also, uh, traffic is king. I put the rules in there to where people were um, allowed to attack traffic, because you can use tools like EdoCap, man in the middle of the traffic. You're not hacking the website at all, you're just modifying the traffic and putting your own team tag in it in the middle. Because essentially the way art poisoning works is um, I say, hey Bill, you want to talk to Georgia? Um, uh, yeah, her MAC address is mine. Georgia, you want to talk to Bill? Okay, his MAC address is actually my MAC address. And I'm in the middle passing messages back and forth between them, and they don't necessarily know that someone's in the middle of them. Uh, this is the classic or, uh, Bob, Eve, and Alice attack, where Eve is the intruder looking at the traffic going between. Since the traffic's going through you, you can modify it and put your own team tag in it. The first people to run the first NetConf I've ever ran were doing that. Were just, they weren't even necessarily hacking the box, they just put in their own team tag in using EdoCap or a similar tool. Uh, some people said that seemed a little unfair. It's like, well, didn't they really hack the boxes? That doesn't seem right. From a corporate standpoint, does it really matter if they actually hacked your website from a PR standpoint? or they hacked some kind of traffic in the middle, as long as it says bad things on your website, it's still the same to you. Uh, so you can man the middle, change what the score box sees. Is it fair? I personally think it is fair, so, so be it. And so the very next game, I made sure I had all the commands set up so that people wouldn't necessarily be able to do that forever. And you can set static op. Now setting static op in a real network would be a massive pain in the butt. Uh, but on this little small test network that I run NetCop on, not so hard. And so you can basically defeat a art poisoning attack by setting up static art. And since then, I've written a tool called Art Freeze for Windows, on the Windows side at least, where you can go and say, OK, this is my current MAC address table of MAC addresses to IP addresses. Lock this down in this way. So you might want to check that out. I don't have a link for it in this slide deck. Um, sometimes it's surprising that people don't try. Password reuse. I've been throwing out these same VMs for a while now, and I've been using the same password for the administrator account and the root account, and people don't seem to exploit that. I mean, once you get into the Windows box with a simple, what is it, MS06067? Oh, MS08067. Uh, once you get into that, you can dump the hashes, crack the password, especially on the uh, rather old Windows XP box I got, and uh, crack the password on that. Why not try that same password as root on the Linux box? I don't necessarily see people trying that. Um, time allocation. I also see people get really, and this may be, there's a lot of people in the hacker community who are OCD. It's like, I gotta get into this box. This box I know is there. I can get into this. I can do it in this. Well, they're trying to get into this hardened box. There's all these other low hanging fruit that they could try to get into and be making points. And this is kind of like a real world pen test in a way, because uh, there might be a hardened box that has the information you really want to get into. But if you can get a ton of low hanging fruit that still gets you the information, yeah, you may not be able to break into the corporate service, but if someone has some old uh, Rico Sabin printer where they print off something sensitive or scan something sensitive and they left it in the document store where you can just go grab it without a password, why go to the effort? And if you have limited time, low-hanging fruit is the way to go. Also, the thing that kind of shocks me is uh, I'm hoping that if more people play this game, they start getting good at scripting. Because let's say at least something incredibly vulnerable, well, once you deface a site, why not have a script that automatically runs in the background and whenever you see someone else deface it, you automatically put yours back. And then you get into a war of who can script the best bots to automatically control the network that they currently own. But I haven't seen a whole lot of that as of yet. Um, now, to make things more interesting, I'll, 
I like to do little inactivity, you know, screw with people, you change with things along the way, I maybe throw in some false flags, like for instance, I might uh, leave INET pub on the C drive, it, you know, C INET pub for uh, IIS, but I may leave the directory there, but change where IIS is actually pulling web pages from. I had a buddy once who, great pen tested, knows all sorts of stuff, but he wasn't as familiar with Windows, and so he got into a box like within seconds of seeing it, but he was like, wait, where the hell do they store the uh, files for the website? That took a little bit longer. Um, is it the fairness of the referee being the blue team? I guess it depends on who. I think I'm a fairly fair uh, ref for this, and I don't usually mess with the game too much unless someone's getting so far ahead that it's no longer an interesting game. Uh, I was mentioning that before about moving around where WWW is. Uh, I do have some ideas for future games, and uh, that's Netcock in a nutshell. If I have an idea for another game I'd like to design, I'm not sure when and if I'd ever run it. I've been thinking about running this at DerbyCon at some point in time. But essentially, it's a demolition DerbyCon. Everybody brings a laptop as a certain set configuration, or everybody gets a VM for the laptop as a certain set configuration. And you get so many minutes to fix it, then it goes on the network. And you're fighting other people with that same VM, and you're trying to own their VM, they're trying to own your VM, and essentially you have um, well, a demolition derby on your laptops. And so you have like a own little red team, blue team automatically where you've got to protect your network and keep it patched and running where you're trying to own everybody else's. But I haven't come a whole a long way of that as of yet. And points would be gained by basically grabbing flags off of your opponent's VMs. Like everybody would have their own unique hash on there that you'd have to grab as proof that you own that box at some point in time. Being up and scorable, I'm not sure how exactly I'm going to do that as of yet because uh, my the scoring engine for that will probably be harder than Netcock. And people will come up with various questions like, well, should I spend more time in the first few minutes of the game patching or should I spend the first few minutes exploiting? Because if you don't patch yourself up you know, very early on, people are more likely to own you, but your best time for exploiting others is before they get an opportunity to patch. So I'd be interested to see how strategies go with that game. And uh, I think it has a lot of nasty potential, but I haven't actually done it as of yet. That's pretty much all I have for my talk in uh, intro to how NetCoff works. I'm about to go set up the entire uh, game system so people can play it. Uh, you'll be attaching to, once again, NetCoff. And I have uh, a bunch of rules printed off that we printed off at the business center of the hotel. Uh, but before I continue on, I'd like to announce DubyCon this year. It's going to be happening at September 25th to the 29th. Hey, 25th and 26th, I think it's mostly training, so it's actually... Uh, I guess 27, 28, and 29th would be the main days for people who are only interested in coming to the main con. And then there's a bunch of other conferences I go to that I want to give a shout out, like Louisville Intersec, Skydog Con, Hacker Con, Out of Zone, Freaknik, and Not a Con. Hacker Con's in West Virginia, by the way. Hacker Con's in West Virginia. It's about a 45 minute drive from here. Mm -hmm. Charles. And I've enjoyed it. I've been to all three of them, so. And uh, that's pretty much all for my talk. <laughs> if anyone wants to follow me or ask me questions, I have a Twitter account. and. Uh, or you can just ask questions now, seeing as how I ran through that fairly quickly. Why is your answer to the question always 42? Why is it 42? That's a Douglas Adams reference. Hitchhiker's Guide to the uh -huh. Galaxy. Yes. That's What's the meaning of the universe? You know, yes. all, the, all right, the question's longer than that. But The, the only thing yeah. I Thanks have to finish. add is that well, who here is a professional penetration tester, and you don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to. I ask you to please team up with new people who have never played before. Passion. <laughs> Reach out and help your new. Reach out and help people who have never played before. I can't play, uh, I can but I've got to leave in the middle of it. But, you know, find somebody that's never played before, has an interest, so they can at least watch. If not. We also want to give away a book. You want to give away a book? Oh, yeah, I can give away a book. Um, should I come up with a question? I don't have a ticket. Oh, we didn't get one. Nobody gave me one. Oh, you have to take it right <coughs> Can we read the number, please? Uh, uh, 60, 50, 96. Anybody have 60, 50, 96? Can you play with us? Yes. 60, 50, 96. Oh, you got, I'll turn it away. You get to pick a Singress book off the table. And unfortunately, the one we're going to use is a textbook, and the fall's already gone. <laughs> all right, well, I think that's it for my talk, unless you have some more stuff to say. If you all want to take a break uh, for about 20 minutes, Adrian needs to get set up, and then Georgia probably wants to get herself together before her big talk. Um, well, you are together. you got your shoulders on. Yeah, I have a shoulder on. Okay. You need some spikes on break. break.
The spikes are preserving don't, con. Don't. Okay. Also, don't so forget. Don't forget there. hallway con. You know, that's the time you network with other people at the conference. So take 20 minutes and hang out with each other. I need a medium.